this is our town. It's probably just like your town, whether it's a country town or a satellite suburb of a city. It has houses, shops, services and industry. The industries here are a mixed bag. We have foundries, an aluminium smelter, cool stores to service our fruit and meat producers, and fuel storage tanks to keep things on the move. There's also a polystyrene factory, a couple of furniture manufacturers, and a factory which produces foam products. All these factories are good neighbours, and, like good neighbours, they mind their own business. No one knows the detail of what goes on in the factory next door, or wants to, probably just like your town. And probably just like your town, we never thought about the what-ifs. For example, what if, a few weeks ago, fire had almost destroyed the town? It was a windy day. Most of our town's firefighting units were out fighting bushfires. The local paper talked about the bushfires threatening the town. But in fact, the danger was from within. Who'd have thought such a little accident could nearly have been the end of our town? When the fire was discovered, the company fire team went into action to fight the localised fire. We get the fire team. Hey! Back in the building, quick, hey! Fire extinguishers were applied, but the fire kept spreading. Then the fire really got out of control. And in the panic, no one had called the fire brigade until that stage. The factory manager tried to phone the factory down the road to ask if they could spare half a dozen blokes and a fire hose. But then the phones went dead, the wires burnt out. There was no other way of communicating. In the meantime, the fellows down the road had decided for themselves to get in and lend a hand to put out their neighbour's blaze. They rushed in with their fire tender, but then they didn't know where the hydrants were, and there was a lot of confusion about whether their couplings would be compatible. When they finally got the hose connected, they decided to pour water onto a section of the building that looked threatened. They were on unfamiliar ground without coordination. Their water and the contents of that building would produce a toxic gas which would cripple the fellows inside fighting a localised fire. One of the volunteers from next door saw the burn-off pipe. Thinking that he would be reducing the release of gas in the area, he turned off the valves. He wasn't to know that he created an enormous pressure build-up until... fire brigade arrived, they took control of the situation. All available fire teams, including those from the factory, were given their tasks. Come on, quicker. Water on.
backup fire units were on their way, but it seemed to take no time at all before the fire spread to the adjoining factory and then to the cool store. Then, the oil storage. Good evening and welcome to the 6.30 News. Massive cleaning up operations are underway in our town after yesterday's tragic fires. The fire will have long-term economic consequences for the area, as Roger Grant reports. The damage, which is estimated in millions, will have a long-term effect on the business of the area. Two of the major employers said today it was not financially worthwhile rebuilding their factories. If the factories are not rebuilt, hundreds of men will be out of work. The Chamber of Commerce, in a statement issued today, said this unemployment will cause a flow on to the shops and service industries of the town. This is Roger Grant in our town. Well, it could have happened like that, but it didn't. I guess it took near disaster to get us all thinking. Have I informed the fire brigade of the new chemical process I'm using? How can I communicate to nearby factories if an emergency gets out of hand? Well, my neighbour agreed to lend emergency equipment or men if I need them. What happens to my factory in the time between when the emergency services are alerted and when they arrive here? It just concerns me that if the people next door have an emergency and can't control it, I could be out of business. Well, when you think about it, we haven't done anything about planning for an emergency with any of the group of factories in the town, have we? I wouldn't know where to start. Why don't we get all the factories together and see what they have to say? The State Emergency Service has responsibility for counter-disaster planning. I'll give them a call and see what they think. As I said in the letter I sent to you, some of us are a bit concerned that we don't know of a disaster plan for our area. And we've all invested hundreds of thousands of dollars in our various businesses, and it's no good being ostriches about not just fire, but about other dangers that we could cause each other if things get out of hand. So, I've invited John Hay of the State Emergency Service to discuss the concept of mutual aid and what benefits we can obtain by planning for the day that we hope will never happen. But, what if it does? Thanks, John. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have no doubt that many of you have excellent emergency procedures within your own organisations. However, cost limitations will usually prevent any individual company from having sufficient resources to cope with the effects of a major emergency. The principle of mutual aid is achieving the formal agreement of your various companies to provide assistance to each other during an emergency in the form of equipment, material and personnel. Very briefly, let's look at the sequence involved in establishing a mutual aid group. The first step is the planning process, where we identify the risk or threat. This will be for individual companies and the group as a whole. We will then assess requirements to meet the identified risks, identify and assess resources, remembering that we can look at the resources held by the group as a whole and not just by individual companies. Carry out liaison with statutory authorities and group companies. An outline plan is then produced. We will then need committees to consider control structure, warning systems, emergency operation centres, communications, centralised facilities and many other aspects. A detailed plan is then written and ratified by group members. At the completion of the planning process, the group then trains to the plan. This takes place in the form of individual training, company training, followed by group training. We then conduct exercises to prove that the plan works. Where necessary, the plan is amended to meet additional requirements. I'm sure you'll realise from those headings that to be successful, a mutual aid group must have the wholehearted support of your senior managements. Support that goes further than just rendering lip service to the concept. Management must give encouragement, financial allocation and sufficient time for those members involved to carry out their allotted tasks. And from experience of other groups, I can assure you that it is not all one way. The benefits your companies will receive far outweigh the time and costs involved in setting up a mutual aid group. That was the first of a series of meetings for our new organisation. The representatives of these companies took the information back to their managements, who all agreed to proceed with the formation of a mutual aid group. We formed subcommittees, one to set up a constitution, and others to look at compatibility and resource problems, training and communication. We've got to rely on the telephone. 
Well, we've all got to get our act together and get together on a compatible frequency. Yes, well, the same with our company. We have six sets of uh, remote breathing apparatus that could be supplied, but we would have to check if it's the type that fits with the equipment supplied by the other companies. Water pressure has always been a problem. I think we might have to contact the City Council and do something about it. We can provide eight men who are trained in first aid here. Mm. And how will you be set up for a major burn situation? Well, obviously, with burns, we'll have to expand a fair bit. Uh, John, you know, it's Doug. I've got a resources list in front of me for the mutual aid and industry group. Yeah. Uh, I'd like you to check a few things for me. Okay, compressors, we've got them, one by 250 cubic feet and one by 350 cubic feet. Yep, okay, extractor fans, the ones with the canvas chutes. It's really important for us that this gauge here doesn't show a pressure below 50. Would it be possible to have a sign put up indicating that to the brigade should we arrive in a fire so that we know not to turn it down past 50? I'd like to thank the subcommittees for all their work. One of the most significant things to come out of the study is that a number of us were planning to buy similar equipment, much of which would have been incompatible. Now, not only have we solved the compatibility problem, but we've also saved our company's money by bulk buying and receiving hefty discounts for bulk buying. So now, let's turn to putting together our mutual aid plan. Yes, it all took some months to get together. We had now identified men, equipment and vehicles that the mutual aid group could call on. We had sorted out our controls and coordination on paper, but would it work during an emergency? It wasn't long before we put the plan to the test. When he thought he heard an explosion at a nearby factory, one of the mutual aid group members went to investigate. He assessed that it was necessary to call on resources from the mutual aid group. Medical unit and first aiders to the AMC compressor area. Report to the control before going into the area. Request that a VOC be set up your location immediately. On receipt of the initial call, an overall group controller was immediately on his way to the scene. The plan called for an emergency operations centre an EOC to be set up at one of the factories. At the EOC, staff assumed their predetermined roles. The situation is that we have six casualties in the area, three are major and three are minor. We have an immediate gas threat from a leaking flange and request that you stay here as a medical coordinator and send your first aid crew and unit straight into the area. When the controller arrived, he was immediately briefed and he assumed control. There's an immediate fire threat to the gas storage area in there and uh, one gas flange is already leaking. We have Tempco and Camalco medical crews in attendance with Camalco and Tempco fire crews in attendance. Requested police assistance because of the number of on uh, onlookers around the area and also additional stretcher bearers have been required. Your medical coordinator is the sister from Tempco. Here. Yes. And the fire coordinator is the Camalco fire George. Officer. That's George. Right. That's right. Can we confirm that the police assistance has been requested? Right, has George been requested. You right. Yes, right. Camalco AOC, forward control, over. Camalco over. Uh, Roger, AOC. Can you confirm the request for assistance on police, over? On this occasion, the controller and his control team set up their headquarters away from the emergency site. But they received regular reports and directed operations by two-way radios. We've also got the industrial fire brigades in there, but I intend putting the Georgetown and Wanthus units on standby. 
we could also be having some trouble with the uh, bystanders, so I suggest we block off a road, Temka Road, and also on the far corner. Temco unit is available and on standby, so will you deploy? Please. Yes, thank you. Roger, EOC, update on evacuations, four patients as follows. One with a fractured spine, one unconscious, possible spinal injury, one head injury and one chest injury. Please advise if Camalco Medical Centre can handle those four patients. Controller requests update on Tempco. I say again, Tempco fire crews arrival. Repeat, they have not arrived at the scene yet. Over. Sit rep as follows. Result of explosion, further oil fires and gas cylinder fire. It continues. Gas explosion has set off further fires and ignited another gas cylinder. are on their way. I'll arrange the stretcher bearers in the top floor. We require additional manpower for stretcher bearers. Roger. Roger, over. Will you activate the additional manpower for Malco? Knowledge, over. This is Fox Trot 2, over. Uh, I agree, I agree, Fox Trot 2. Fires have been extinguished. We have posted a fire watch uh, of three checks. All fires, no one to control. That was our first mutual aid group training exercise. We learned a lot from it. Our strengths and our weaknesses. Uh, there were a few minor points that came out that I think need discussing. But what we'll do during the course of this debrief is break it up into the various areas and uh, get the opinion of the people that ran those areas. Now, I think we'll start off uh, from the beginning with Don Mackerel, um, who conducted the reconnaissance for the exercise. The reconnaissance was fairly brief because of the potential danger in the area and the acknowledgements from both the companies where resources were requested from, i.e. Camalco and Temco, were received uh, very quickly and subsequently the units requested arrived on site as required. I felt that the original initiation of the uh, alarm was a bit too brief. We weren't supposed to hear it, but if the, uh, our gentleman on the gate had been li listening to a Tradix van or whatever, he'd have missed it. All we got was a mutual aid call and then it was dead silence. The principle of the mutual aid group can be applied to factories, offices and even shopping centres. In our town, we've learned valuable information for the day we hope will never happen. But what if it does? This is our town, where our good neighbour policy is to be ready to help each other whenever necessary. Our town is probably like your town. It's a good place to live and work. 
and we plan to keep it that way, thanks to mutual aid.